Alrighty. So, uh, here we are in what is part two of our lessons on the First Council of Nicaea, in AD 325. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction last week that I'd allowed room for a third part to make sure that lessons weren't too long, and I've chosen to do that. Uh, so this is a smaller lesson, and we'll have a, another one then, part three, next week, um, where we'll be looking specifically at some of the more th theological bases, bases of the original Nicene Creed. And what I mean by original uh, will become uh, illuminated to us by the time we get through this lesson today. Um, but here, in this lesson, part two, we're going to be focusing on things specifically in the council, so namely some of the attendees, uh, who was there, some of the figures which will become important to our, uh, not just on Nicaea, the first council of Nicaea, but also going forward throughout the rest of this century, which we're in the fourth century here, uh, figures which will become important throughout that time. Uh, and so highlighting who some of those are uh, will be relevant to us going forward as well. Uh, as well as what the agenda was specifically, I'll be touching on parts of it because they're not our primary focus. Our primary focus is going to be on what the primary focus of this council was, which was the Aryan controversy. Uh, and then I'll finish off by reading through the original Nicene Creed uh, and the further commentaries where we'll actually be able to look at some of the original language in the Greek, some of the theological debates back and forth. That'll be let's say for next week's uh, or for the next lesson itself, lesson 21. Okay, so uh, that same uh, painting, that same icon that we saw last week of the council, uh, I've also featured for us again on the on the on the title page or on the cover page. You have the Emperor Constantine the Great seated uh, there centrally. Uh, he wasn't there in person for most of it. He was represented by one of the figures that we're going to be looking at um, when we get to the attendees in just a moment. He's then surrounded by some of the uh, patriarchs of the major uh, apostolic sees, S-E-E, or apostolic churches, like Alexandria and Antioch and, and so on and so forth. Um, and you also have this anachronistic uh, inclusion of Hagia Sophia, the uh, great cathedral of Constantinople, uh, which was not built yet, uh, but was, of course, nearby uh, Nicaea, and so that's also then included. But uh, our focus then is going to be first on the attendees, which will be on, on page two of your, of your study notes. So, as mentioned last week, the, uh, the Council of Nicaea, the first council in AD 325, was considered the first ecumenical council in church history, the first council drawing from those all around the ecumeni or the inhabited world, the, the worldwide church. It drew uh, as far as Athanasius of Alexandria listed, who was one of the main, um, main men involved in this council, 318, but I explained last week that there's a range given by different figures. Some say there was more than 250, which 318 is certainly more than 250. Some say it was about 270. Athanasius, who was there and right in the thick of it, gives a very specific number, but long story short, 250 to 320 or so, roughly, from around the empire. There were many more than this uh, invited. About 1,800 bishops, in fact, from around the world were invited. Um, but around 300, or to use Athanasius's number, 318, were those uh, that came. They were each allowed to bring two presbyters or two pastors, if you want to think of it that way, uh, as well as three deacons, so a sort of uh, entourage, as it were, uh, and about 1,800 delegates in total across the, across the, from across the church came. Um, there also were delegates representing the territories of the Sassanid Empire. Uh, the Sassanid Empire is one of the Iranic or Persian empires that existed in that time. It was a successor to what was called the Parthian Empire. Um, and the Sassanid lands were beyond Rome. They were to the east. They were in the lands of what today is Iran, Iraq, uh, down around the Arabian Gulf, for example. So you had other delegates coming from Christian from Christian churches throughout the Middle East and, and Arabia and whatnot. And the Western churches, this also got mentioned last week, only sent about five to, to seven delegates. Um, and some of those we'll, we'll, we'll actually list here because there's so few of them. Um, this issue was largely dealing with Arianism in the eastern portions of the world, and that's why it's so heavily focused on the east. But again, we covered that in large part last week. So some of these attendees, specifically because there's so few, we actually know the names of the one from the west. Uh, there are five uh, bishops who attend, as well as two representatives from the Church of Rome. So those from the west, and I'll 
highlight why some of them are important. You have Marcus of Calabria from the Roman province of Italia, or Italy, Monda Italy. You have Caecilian of Carthage. Carthage, of course, the famous uh, city that the Romans, uh, the Roman Republic battled against uh, in the centuries prior to Christ in, the Roman, in what would become the Roman province of Africa. Many other church, famous church fathers, uh, Cyprian, earlier on uh, in the third century was from uh, Carthage as well. Nicasius of Dia in Gaul. Uh, so Gaul is essentially today uh, what is France and, and Belgium. Domnus of Sirmium, which is in the Roman province of the Danube, or in other words, near the Danube River in today what is the Balkans. So the Roman provinces of the countries today that are places like Croatia and Serbia and Slovenia and so on and so forth, as well as, and this is the most important of these figures, Osseus or Hosius of Cordoba in the Roman province of Hispania. Hispanian, you might be able to pick the name there. Modern day Spain, in case the Iberian Peninsula. The reason why highlighting him, and we make note of this in, in your study notes, he was representing and presiding for the Emperor Constantine. Okay? So Constantine chose Osseus of Cordoba to preside over the church council and to also represent him in the council, if that makes sense. So he becomes kind of a very central figure, obviously from a uh, kind of procedural standpoint, as well as from a theological one. But Osseus comes up over and over again in many of the deliberations when you start reading some of the specific source material from the time uh, as one of the central figures because he was chosen by the Emperor Constantine to represent him and to preside over the whole uh, church council itself. So those are the Western bishops that were present, and then there were two representatives from the Church of Rome. Um, the Bishop of Rome at the time uh, did not attend personally or in person, um, again, largely for those factors which we explained last week, which was that Arianism was a predominantly Eastern issue at this time. It was plaguing and infesting the Eastern churches. Later on, it would uh, cut, rear its head in the West and spread all throughout the West uh, of the imperial territories and then the post-Roman imperial territories and kingdoms. Um, but at this time, the Church of Rome felt it sufficient to just send two of their delegates. Most importantly, though, are some of our uh, Eastern representatives themselves. Um, and these are figures which will heavily feature in predominantly next week when we're starting to look at some of the very specific kind of theological debate and dialogue that goes into the creed. And a number of these figures, it's important to see who they are here so that when they pop up next week uh, in the next lesson, we'll then, you'll then already understand kind of who we're broadly talking about. We've already heard of Alexander of Alexandria in previous lessons. He is Archbishop of Alexandria, of course, in, in Egypt, um, where the Arian heresy began uh, in that city in, in northern, northern Egypt, up in the Nile Delta. Um, and he is accompanied by a man who essentially becomes the most famous of these figures eventually throughout this century, Athanasius of Alexandria. Um, Athanasius, whilst not being archbishop at the time, he is uh, essentially a presbyter and a servant of Alexander. He's a subordinate. Um, he is basically about my age, roughly. Uh, by the time you get to the Council of Nicaea, he's about 27, going on 28. Um, and so right around this time, as a, as a young man, he is present. But he's also very uh, active in a lot of the theological discussions. Um, he was much wiser beyond his years. Uh, and so his contributions to the, theolo to the theological discourse that goes on at this council is, is very, well, not just merely prolific, it's in fact central and fundamental. And a number of the words that get chosen, some of the phraseology, um, the way it's structured is directly impacted upon his actual uh, you know, putting forth of the idea or his actual recommendations. So they essentially come together, Alexander of Alexandria and Athanasius of Alexander, Andrea. So Alexander and Athanasius, they will come up many times more again. You then, moving on from that, have Estathios of Antioch, the Church of Antioch, of course, a major church, uh, the first major uh, Gentile or Greek church outside of Jerusalem in the book of Acts, which our Bible study students have been working through. Um, the Arian heresy, uh, that battle has been raging uh, to quite a degree in Antioch as well as Alexandria. Um, and he comes uh, as one of the great defenders of the Trinitarian uh, concept of the truth of Scripture that plays out with regards to Christ's divinity, the fact that he is God, that he is eternal, that he is 
consubstantial or of the same substance with the Father, all the things which we're going to read about by the time we get to the Creed as well as look, you know, dive into more importantly next week. The third figure there, Marcellus of Ankira. Ankira is uh, what today is known as Ankara, the capital of Turkey, capital of the modern day country of Turkey. They're in roughly speaking, northern Turkey. Uh, Marcellus is, is again a central figure in the defence of the Trinity and in the defence of the divinity of Christ. All these figures are, by the way. These are all uh, pro-Trinitarian figures and, and anti-Aryan anti figures. Um, some of the Aryan figures, which will that'll mainly get covered next week as we work our way through. Um, but those kind of top three, or I suppose four if you include Athanasius, those top four figures, Alexander, Athanasius, Ephstathios and Marcellius, those are the, the kind of core, the inner core, the inner circle, so it were, who do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, they're not the only ones. Uh, they're supported by many of these other ones. I've only just mentioned a couple for highlight because, of course, there's hundreds of bishops um, from around the east. Um, but these are just some of the more notable uh, figures. But those top uh, four gentlemen are doing a lot of the work in debate and in the wording of what the creed ends up becoming, and so they'll come forward and through the coming weeks. Some of the other important yet comparatively minor figures, at least compared to those men, uh, you have Theophilus of the Goths. The reason why I mention him, not that he's a major player in the, in the council itself, but the Goths, who are one of the Germanic tribes uh, from Germania up in the north, which were beyond the territories of the Roman Empire, he, Theophilus, a Greek man, uh, is sent forth to evangelise them, and he is pro-Trinitarian, he's anti-Aryan, he's, he's Nicene in that sense, um, and he is doing a lot of good work. When he passes away, the man that succeeds him uh, is unfortunately an Aryan. And so this is how Christianity among the Goths, so the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths figures, if you've studied history, you might be aware of, um, who end up conquering or largely conquering the Western Roman Empire over the next 100 to 200 years after this time. The reason why they become Arian is because the successor to Theophilus as archbishop or as bishop, he is an Arian and he destroys a lot of the work that Theophilus did and that's how Arianism spreads to the Goths. Okay. Furthermore, you have Achilles of Larissa. Larissa is in the territory of Thessaly. So if you're familiar, of course, in the New Testament, uh, Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians, uh, he is from that church. Um, and fortunately, Achilles uh, was a very staunch defender in Thessaly. Um, he defended uh, biblical Christianity and the, and, the, and the orthodox view of Christ as God in the flesh very ardently in the Church of Thessaly, and the Church of Thessaly was largely saved by, in terms of its doctrine and praxis, by this man, Achilles. And so his mentioning there is, is for that purpose, where this church that, we, that of course, the Apostle wrote those two letters to uh, was largely saved by the work of this one man at this particular juncture in the fourth century. And then the last one who features there and who has a, a particular legend that comes from that time, uh, one of the more notable figures in the Council of Nicaea was Santa Claus, namely the one who is called Nicholas of Myra. Uh, the term that we have in English, Santa Claus, comes from the Dutch Sinterklaas, that I'm horribly mispronouncing, um, but Sinterklaas uh, is where we get the term Santa Claus, Sinterklaas meaning Saint Claus or Saint Nicholas. And this is referring to a man, Nicola of, uh, Nicholas of Myra. Um, very famous for his charity. Uh, he was a very, very generous man. Um, the whole concept of gift giving in association with Christmas comes from many of the works that he did in terms of charity. Uh, one time, for example, he famously uh, rescued three young women from prostitution and enslavement by dropping in their windows of a night time for three days straight some gold coins that they could then use to redeem themselves from that sexual slavery. And so the whole concept of Santa coming down the chimney and leaving gifts in the middle of the night uh, traces its origins back to the, the real charitable work of, of Nicholas of Myra. Um, another, which is not mainly the point, I'm just going off on some of the, the, the reasons for mentioning him, uh, there is a, a legend that develops. Uh, the first writing of it is nearly a thousand years after Nicholas of Myra. So there is reason to think that it is not original, of course. I actually happen to take a minority view of it. I think that it is real, um, and I'll explain what I mean in a moment. 
According to legend at the Council of Nicaea, at a certain point, either Arius or one of his followers, probably Arius, uh, is explaining his theology and explaining how Christ is not truly God, he's not, in a sense, he's not eternal, specifically. Uh, he's not of the same substance as the Father. He's subordinate to God the Father, so on and so forth, um, by nature. And at, at one point, Nicholas gets up, walks up to Arius and slaps him in the face. Um, whether it was a slap or a punch depends on which legend one looks at. Um, Nicholas uh, was also known to be, according to some of the more ancient historical sources, to be very passionate, um, <laughs> and that passion seems to have translated across. Now, this legend doesn't get mentioned for about a thousand years after that time. It's only until about, obviously, this council is happening in the fourth century. Uh, it's not until about the 14th century in Western Europe that we start to see this story being told. Nicholas of Myra is also very sparsely mentioned in the list. In fact, Athanasius himself does not actually list Nicholas as being there. So some secular scholars have taken that to mean that Nicholas of Myra was not actually there. What I would argue, I'm not the only one who's argued this, by the way, other historians have also, uh, but what I would argue is that I think that perhaps the incident of him essentially punching Arius in the face may have actually happened. Um, because what is then told in consort with those details is that he was then confined by some of the guards at the council, and rightfully so. He was defrocked for a time, so in other words, he was removed from the bishopric. Um, he was restored later on, but he was removed and punished, and, and we're being smart, rightfully so if that happened. Um, uh, we can't let passions run, run fast and punch heretics in the face as much as we may want to. Um, and as much as he no doubt wanted to do. I think that that may well have happened. I'm not saying it did. This is an academic opinion. I think it may well have happened, which is why Athanasius and some of the others don't mention him on the list, because some do, some don't. That's how we know he probably actually was there. Some mention him, some don't mention him. I think his memory from the council was removed because of his actions, so as a punishment in essence, and not wanting to besmirch his reputation or memory. Um, and that he may well have actually done that, and that's why that story doesn't get told in the early medieval period, but by the time you kind of get to the high medieval period, the story is then rediscovered right around the time of the Renaissance, when in Europe, particularly in Italy, so the, in Florence and Venice, um, a lot of ancient Greek and Roman documents are being found, where a number of those lists of Nicholas being present are also found. And I think it's probably because of the Renaissance that then that story of him having done that is rediscovered as many historical events were rediscovered in the Renaissance in Western Europe. Um, that's an opinion and is simply for historical fact and tidbit uh, to be able to explain uh, the origins of, of, of old Santa Claus or Saint Nicholas. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we can either take one of two lessons from that, either one, we should punch heretics in the face, or we should probably be a bit more disciplined and self-controlled. Um, I'd suggest in nine times out of ten that it's probably the latter is the answer. Um, but nevertheless, his presence there is something which uh, carries with it that particular historical legend. So, many more bishops, of course, from the East were present. This is just simply the highlight package, um, especially for those, more importantly, for the first four of those gentlemen. Alexander, Athanasius, uh, Eustathios, and Marcellius. Those figures are going to be very important to when we look at the, the, the specific doctrinal points next week, okay? So, on to the agenda. This is short and, and very brief, fortunately. Um, the primary focus will be, of course, upon that first point. They didn't go to the effort of convening bishops and delegates from all around the world simply to have them talk over one simple issue. Uh, well, it's not simple, but one specific issue. Uh, they included other things. Um, and obviously the main focus and the vast majority of the council was dealing with the Arian controversy, but they also dealt with two other issues, uh, which I'll just at least explain just in brevity because they're, much, they're complex issues in their own right. One of which was concerning the date of Easter. Um, we have actually covered in previous church history lessons, I think when we looked at Polycarp, I want to say, Polycarp of Smyrna, when we were looking at the Apostolic Fathers. Um, Christians in the eastern half of the world, the eastern provinces of the world, celebrated Easter on a different date than those in the West. So in other words, essentially, 
Greek-speaking Christians celebrated Easter at a different time than Latin-speaking Christians. That's a rough way of thinking of it. The custom in the eastern portions of the world, which we explained in those lessons going back uh, many months now, of course, um, was to celebrate the, the date itself, so the date of when Easter was, was what's imp- what was important. And obviously when you lock in the date... Uh, what in the Hebrew calendar is called the, the 14th of Nisan, um, which is roughly equivalent to March, April, um, hence why it's around that time, of course, even to this day. Uh, when you choose a specific date, of course, the day is going to move from year to year naturally um, as the calendar cycles through. The custom in the Latin West was on the day. They placed the significance, of course, on the Friday and then especially Easter Sunday itself and all of the inherent symbolism of Christ rising on the Sunday, the first day of the week, everything we see from the days in which this occurred uh, in the Gospels. Um, and that was, uh, that was largely resolved, and then it unfortunately spilled into problems, uh, and, and very fiery tempers uh, abounded, and then it was resolved again, then it back and forth, back and forth. Long story short, by this point, the date of Easter, as far as the Hebrew calendar itself, was very much uncertain. Hebrew had been a functionally dead language for many centuries by this point, uh, and the certainty concerning uh, when those specific dates actually were in the Hebrew calendar was by now very uncertain. Um, and so there was some debate and deliberation as to what to do. Long story short, they agreed to unify with the Roman customs, in other words, the Western custom of when, when the date of Easter should specifically fall itself. So that's essentially what they're dealing with. So to do with bringing unity on when it was to be done, not necessarily with the days, because the Eastern churches in Christianity still do use the day, but the date was what was being resolved there. More importantly, uh, or just alongside that really, the, what's called the Miletian uh, Schism, Again, a comparatively minor issue compared to the Arian controversy, uh, but it had to do with uh, a schism in a church caused by a man named Miletius and another theological dispute concerning a whole host of other issues which would then take up much more of our time than we want to. So the first uh, order of things was on the the Arian controversy, which took up the vast majority of the time and, of course, was the central purpose for it. So to round off today, we're just simply wanting to read through the, the creed as produced from that first council. You'll find that on, on page three of your study notes. Um, it's important to point out too, um, again, it's also in the study notes or on the screen above you, um, before you, um, to understand how I've kind of just highlighted this so we can see some of the differences. I'll explain it further as we go through, obviously. The bold text, just straight bold text, is is all of the original pieces from AD 325, Okay. You'll notice, of course, because we, we, of course, proclaim the Nicene Creed, you know, uh, in, in, in interjunction with the, the Apostles' Creed, you'll notice some of the wording that's familiar or unfamiliar from this creed. As we then go through to the, to the next council, you know, in the coming weeks and months, um, with regards to the First Council of Constantinople in 381, which essentially deals with the lingering Arianism and puts the proverbial nail in the coffin, they update the Nicene Creed. It's why sometimes in academia we refer to it as the, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. But in short, we just call it the Nicene Creed because it was updated. Um, this is the original version, and that's in bold, the text you see on your page in front of you, okay? Um, in italic, so not bold, but italic, those are the, the words that we all recite, that we've been reciting now since in Christianity 381, that are from, the, from that updated version 381, but are not present in the original version, okay? So when you're reading it on the page, I've included it in it, it's not part of the original. So if you were to try and read the original, you would just simply read the bold text itself, okay? That third category, bold italics, not to be confused with bold or italic only, but bold italic, is actually, there's only two little portions, and I'll point them out there, there earlier on, but I'll point them out when we get to them, um, as well as one little bit at the end. Uh, they are original to, the, they're from the original creed, but they actually removed it from the later one. Okay? So the vast majority of things were added and in the updated version, expanded. When I say added, not changing it as in like, oh, they changed their mind. It's an expansion of the concept. You'll see that when we get into the Holy Spirit, um, the reference there in a minute. Um, but there's a couple of little sections where they had things in the original, they decided to trim that and expand other places. Does that make sense? Right? I'll try and make that as plain and obvious as I can as we, as we read through, okay? Um, so just follow along, obviously, Fiona, as we go through in the text. So, in, beginning, beginning there in, in page three. 
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty. And then it moves through in the original version, maker of all things visible and invisible. Obviously, the updated version that we all proclaim has in parentheses there in plain italic, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. It continues on the second line, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The updated version has only begotten, which when we get onto that council, we, well, you already see why next week, because only begotten became a very important sticking point um, that they then add in in, in the Constantinopolitan version. The, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the updated version adds before all worlds, the only begotten, and this is now, I want you to notice the transition, pay attention. So in this fourth line, you've now got bold italics. Okay, the only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father. That was in the original, 325, they then remove that in favour of that previous sentence, the only begotten Son of God, because it's much simpler and straightforward, okay? Um, so the only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, was there in Nicaea, they then remove that or trim that in, in the updated version. But it continues with the famous phraseology, which you'll notice from the Nicene Creed that we proclaim, God of God, light of light, true God of true God. That is one of the most important pieces of this entire creed, especially true God of true God, and that will become a major highlight point next week for us. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. One substance being what's uh, sometimes, <clears throat> pardon me, elsewhere translated into English, consubstantial, uh, big words, but we'll explain all of that next week. Fortunately, it's actually quite straightforward. Once you just have a grasp on what's being talked about, it all becomes quite plain, uh, to be honest with you. Um, not plain when you're sitting there for the first time in church history trying to work these things out amidst great disagreement and debate. Um, but fortunately for us, looking back, uh, these things are straightforward and, and we praise God that, fortunately, very intelligent men <laughs> and very faithful men worked through these things logically and rationally, drawing it out from the scriptures and from church history. One substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. And this is now another bold italic, so this is in the original 325, but they remove it later. Things in heaven and things on earth. Okay, they remove that, not because it's not true, but because they've already mentioned that elsewhere. Who for us men and for our salvation came down, they add later on from heaven. And became incarnate, they add later on, by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, a very important point, uh, which was very providential by the time we, I'll save it for when we get into the Council of Constantinople in, in 381, because the big problem in the, in, the, in the century that follows, the 5th century, so the 400s, is over issues like the virgin birth and whether Jesus was actually God in the womb or whether he became God through the birth. So the fact that they included this in 381 eventually ends up saving them <laughs> a lot of time in the century that then follows later on. But of course, we'll cover that in those councils when we get to it. And was made man, the updated version later on adds, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. But the original just continues, and he suffered and was buried in the updated. And the third day he rose again. That's where it ends in the original. The updated version adds, according to the scriptures, the original and ascended into heaven, updated and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come, again with glory in the updated, to judge both the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. And so then, of course, on your page there, you'll see a gigantic chunk of text, basically almost a paragraph of things in plain italic that gets updated later on. So when we're, when we're proclaiming the Nicene Creed and professing the faith, we, of course, say, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. All that portion was not in the original. The original essentially just finished with, and in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, the reason given for this, and it's an accurate assessment, of course, the great uh, focus with regards to the Arian controversy was on the nature of Jesus Christ. Okay? The Holy Spirit was not really in view here. Uh, not that people were denying the Holy Spirit existed, and in fact, no one was actually denying that the Holy Spirit was God per se. Um, 
uh, the issue was all so heavily focused on the nature of who Jesus is, fully God, fully man, and what all that means. Is he eternal? Is he not? Uh, what does begotten mean? Um, uh, you know, what's his relationship to God the Father in terms of his nature and everything else, so on and so forth, that the Holy Spirit just got one little half sentence of, and in the Holy Spirit, <laughs> almost like an afterthought. Um, not that he was, it's just simply that the Holy Spirit was not the one in focus. So, of course, then later on, half a century later, they make sure to flesh all of that out. Uh, the Lord and giver of life. The Lord there is that is the divine name, and that's how it gets used in Greek, Kyrios. It's not just merely talking about a human Lord, you know, uh, uh, the Lord of a given province or an estate. Um, the Lord in the New Testament is used to describe divinity. Okay, it's the, it's the Greek version of the divine name in the Old Testament, which we usually translate as, of course, in English, the Lord with those little capitals, what's called majuscule text. So they add all that in later on to make sure that they give equal weight to the divinity of, of the Holy Spirit. But here in the original, the focus is on the nature of who Christ is and the Holy Spirit uh, kind of takes a quasi backseat in, in the creed. But you'll notice there, um, down the bottom after that section, you've then got bold italics. So this was in the original of 325 that they then stripped back from the updated version. Okay, And it was in parentheses, it was part of the creed, I put it in parentheses there just to make a delineation for us, but it, it essentially was the closing paragraph of the original Nicene Creed, okay, from 325, and it reads, but as for those who say, there was, a, there was when he was not, so in other words, there was a, we've explained this kind of logical paradox before, it's weird, to, you can't quite say it. Uh, there was a time before he existed because the whole claim was that he existed before time but that he actually was created by God. So using a term like there was a point when or there was a time when doesn't we get into the realm of, log of logical paradox. So there was when he was not is the way, of the way that they had to word it or before being born he was not or that he came into existence out of nothing which, of course, the world did, but the claim from the Arians was that Christ also did before the creation, or who assert that the Son of God is, is of a different hypostasis or substance. More on that next week, so don't, don't, don't be worried about a word like hypostasis. Or created, or is subject to alteration or change. So, in other words, is mutable, as opposed to one of the characteristics of God. One of his attributes is his immutability, or the fact that he cannot change. He, he is, hence the term, I am who I am. All these various phrases, which were being used by the Arians, and these were all, the, all these phrases were employed by Arius and other supporters of his. These people who claim this, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, anathematizes. Now, anathema in Greek means to curse. Okay? So it, gets, it comes up in the New Testament, rarely, but it's there. Um, to anathematize or to pronounce an anathema or, or a curse is not like when we think of curse, we think of like a, you know, kind of gothic witchcraft or such things. To pronounce an anathema is to condemn for heresy. Okay? It's to evaluate. It's not arbitrary. It's not just whimsical and shouldn't be. In the times when that's happened throughout church history, those have needed to be corrected. And sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't. Um, but an anathema is a very serious thing. It's essentially the end of church discipline. Okay? The person has been brought before fellow Christians, including, of course, most importantly, the church leaders themselves, just like you have here convened in Nicaea in 325. Um, they have given a defence, they've been heard, they've been allowed to present a defence for their views, and then if they are indeed heretical views, kind of zooming back out to the big picture, then those who are bringing the charge of heresy need to then demonstrate that these views are heretical. We'll see how they do that next week, because they do that and they successfully do that, um, because all of these kinds of concepts of Jesus, uh, that, they're be that before being born he was not, you know, there, was a there was a point or a time, even beyond time, when he didn't exist or that he was created out of nothing just like the world was created out of nothing. All these things are antithetical to what gets taught in scripture, okay, because the, the scriptures over and over and over again clearly point Old and New Testament, but of course particularly New Testament, that Jesus is God, he is eternal, he is consubstantial or of the same substance as the Father. So just as the Father is truly God, he is truly God. That's why that wording earlier on, 
God of God, light of light, true God of true God. Okay? Begotten, not made. So they're already setting up, they're already, they're already definitively making a distinction between begotten and not made, which was half the problem for Arius, because in his mind, begotten must mean created out of nothing which was the error, because that's not how it gets used biblically. So more on, that, more on the theology side next week. But this is essentially how uh, the creed concludes. They remove that later on because they just stick, they decide, I think wisely so, um, these are contextual quotations from the Arians, from the enemies of the church, uh, or of, of biblical Christianity, of orthodox Christianity. Um, they decide to just stick with the doctrinal points, the affirmative doctrinal points. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, so on, in the updated version. But that point there, uh, it gets removed um, in the updated version. So as it would read, if you want to read, what does the original creed from 325 look like? Just simply read the, pla- the, the straight, bold reading on your, on your study notes, okay? So that... Uh, essentially is the end of the lesson. Um, like I said, we'll leave the theology for next week. We'll be focusing on on what it means, the difference between begotten and being made, what that means and what they meant by that. We'll look at that kind of famous axiom, God of God, light of light, true God of true God. Um, and especially, of course, the perhaps the most central word, it's only one word in, in, um, in the Greek there, homoousios, which we'll explain next week, which we translate as of being of one substance with the Father. Or in English, you could also say consubstantial, con meaning the same, the same substance. Right? That, we'll look at the theology next week. So if you want to, if you ever, so diving into what that theology is, uh, if you've ever wondered what are, what is the, the deeper meanings of what we've been saying when we pronounce the Nicene Creed, that's where we'll be doing that primary focus. We'll, of course, obviously then do it again in the expanded version when we get to 381 and the Council of Constantinople, a lot of these other terms. Um, but nevertheless, the, theolo- the theological uh, exposition of the Nicene Creed will be our lesson next week, okay? Cool. So that's the end of the lesson. Um, are there any questions or comments about the material we've looked at? It hasn't been terribly complex. Um, it's, it's largely to set us up for, for next week. Any, any contextual questions at all, either, to, either from today or things related to the council more broadly? Very good. All right. Short and sweet. 40 minutes. Very nice. Uh, yes. Next, next lesson, part three, we'll be diving into the theology of the Nicene Creed. Okay. Thank you.